to you from the Visitor Center at San Diego's Mission Trails Regional Park. I'm Jennifer Whitelaw, and behind me, you can see land that was once occupied by the Kumeyaay Indian tribe. Some 50 years ago, local leaders decided to spare much of this area from development and create an open space preserve of pristine mountains, valleys, and canyons, just eight miles from downtown San Diego. As the region has continued to grow, this decision seems even smarter in hindsight. Tonight, we're going to look at another movement afoot to restore, preserve, and protect the canyons that stretch through the rural and urban neighborhoods of San Diego, from the mountains to the ocean. And we're going to introduce you to some of the most passionate advocates for San Diego's canyonlands. They are environmentalist Eric Bowlby, neighborhood activist Tersha Delgin, wetlands educator Shara Fissler, landscape architect Vicki Estrada, and author Richard Louvre, who writes that research has shown that we, as humans, need nature. And there's something in us that we don't fully understand that needs to see natural landscapes, that needs to be immersed in nature, even inside a city from time to time. And when we don't get that, we don't do so well. When we get more of it, we feel better and we're healthier. I consider nature anything in which there are a lot of species other than our own around, uh, so that we're not alone. Now that can be in the Yosemite, but it can also be in a backyard. There's a phrase that people who study this called nearby nature. And that can be the cluster of trees at the end of the cul-de-sac, uh, a canyon in a city like San Diego. San Diego's leading canyon organizer is Eric Bowlby, now with the Sierra Club. Canyons are important to San Diego and San Diegans for a number of reasons. There's the biodiversity. There's a lot of endangered and threatened habitats in our urban canyons. There's the fact that the canyons are scattered all over our city and so they offer a very local access to nature an escape to nature from an otherwise completely paved and urbanized environment right there in your neighborhood a way to sort of get away from the pavement and smog and the cars and smell the sages of our natural habitat this is the black sage right here great great aroma I love it Eric's commitment to canyons became a crusade in the late 1990s when the city of San Diego proposed to put a road here in Switzer Canyon. The city wanted access to the sewer line that ran underneath the canyon floor. At the time I was chair of the Sierra Club and we started a, a campaign to build friends groups around the canyons. We found out that San Diegans love their urban canyons. We thought it, would, it was a, a great way to organize the community around their natural open spaces, raise awareness about the endangered species that are there, the water quality benefits of the riparian woodlands along the streams, and let them learn about what they can do to protect those natural habitats that are right there in their backyards. There are now 34 Friends of Canyons groups in San Diego County, but the first was the Friends of Switzer Canyon. And yes, they won by preventing the city from building a paved road and helping to draft policies that are sensitive to the canyon habitat. Over the years we've developed some friends groups that have really done some pretty uh, dynamic things and the Friends of 32nd Street Canyon is, is one of them. It's got great leadership. Tersha Delgin has rolled up her sleeves to protect her neighborhood's canyon in a variety of ways. Protecting this Golden Hill Canyon has meant fighting a battle on two fronts. The first was against the invasive Arundo, a bamboo-like grass that was choking the canyon. Tertia and the Friends Group helped restore its natural habitat by removing the Arundo, mulching it, and then revegetating the canyon with hundreds of native plants that are now thriving. The second battle was against the San Diego Unified School District. The school district was proposing putting a 6.5 acre campus right in the canyon, which would have involved a lot of grading and ov obviously habitat destruction. The canyon is approxi approximately 12 acres. So they were just going to and put it in there rather than take housing or other properties. So there was a lot of opposition to that, and especially Golden Hill 
I like to think of it as sort of Berkeley South. It's very political and involved in wanting environmental things to be taken care of. There was so much acrimony around it that the school district finally, after all these meetings, came to us and said, okay, we have decided that we're going to put the entire campus above the canyon, not in, and it'll be smaller. That was a huge victory, and we said, well, what about your need for a play field? And they said to us, to meet our curriculum, it would be nice to have a play field, but at the elementary level, we don't need a play field. We can meet our curricular objectives on this 4.5 acre campus that is above the canyon. So we're like, whew, great. But the friends of 32nd Street were a bit premature in declaring that victory. The district is now revisiting the issue of where to locate a sports field for the school. The Friends Group is suggesting options other than in the canyon. A lot of the children who live in this area don't have opportunities to go hiking elsewhere or to have anything other than a man-made environment around them. So being able to get out in it here, whether formally, you know, in an excursion, or just to play is big. And um, I feel needed. So we, as long as the school district was hell-bent to put a school here, we thought, gosh, you know, you could put it actually where they put it and, and have um, ties to the canyon so that the children could become stewards of this nearby environment. There are slopes right below the school that where they could do their own restoration, where they could learn about soils and about plant communities and about taking care of things and having things take care of them. When you think about it, for tens of thousands of years, I mean, for all of human history and all of human prehistory, young people, kids, went outside and played or worked in nature. Within the space of two or three decades, we're seeing the, the gradual disappearance of that. A body of scientific evidence is emerging, finally, because we're finally studying it, that really links children's access to nature and direct involvement with nature with healthy child development. Uh, we know that being in nature has great cognitive benefits to the extent that I think the evidence is such that if we really are interested in uh, improving our schools, what we really need is a leave no child inside campaign. And it's that kind of thinking, teaching kids about the outdoors while being outdoors, that is the organizing principle for Aquatic Adventures, a nonprofit science education foundation run by marine biologist Shara Fissler. And though the group's name would suggest a focus on water, Shara explains why the canyons are part of her curriculum. It's a natural connection because if you're studying coastal and ocean environments, you're talking about water quality as being one of the most important aspects of those areas. And so because of that, of course, we are here, uh, coastal environments are connected to land and our watersheds directly bring the water flow from the surface and into the coastal environments. And so that was a, just a natural connection to start moving up the watershed. And so canyons became um, a huge part of that here in San Diego. The Kids in Canyons program we began as an extension of our work with the schools and the fourth grade students who are studying wetlands and watersheds. And so it became a natural connection to want to start to expose those students to canyons. If kids are living by the ocean, they have access to these kinds of habitats all the time. I mean, our facility here is on Mission Bay, but a lot of people who live in the more urban neighborhoods, they think, okay, I can't go to the beach all the time and I have to take a bus there and it's very challenging. But canyons bisect almost every single urban neighborhood in San Diego County. And so because of that, they're a great opportunity that everybody can access. There's obviously no cost associated with that. And they're all in, usually in walking distance from people's homes. One of the four San Diego schools to participate in Kids in Canyons is Kit Carson Elementary School in Linda Vista. On this spring day, about 60 students join their teachers for the mile-long walk from their school down Linda Vista Road, past the University of San Diego to Tecolote Canyon. There, they were met by the Kids in Canyons program director, Lindsay Goodwin. Can somebody raise their hand and tell me what kind of habitat or ecosystem are we studying about? Wild. Raise your hand. Nature. 
Yeah? Wetlands. Perfect, wetlands. And what? We're trying to get an excitement for the environment, a desire to want to come back and explore a little bit more, open their eyes, I guess, to the opportunities that are in their neighborhoods, not just in their house and the fun games they can play there, but also to get them to see that there's opportunities outside because they naturally have a curiosity and naturally love to kind of see the birds, see what's around them. When it rains, the watershed collects all the water in this area and it comes through these canyons and rivers and streams and off of our streets, okay, and it ends up all the way down into the ocean. Now the wetlands we studied before... When we are in a natural habitat, we tend to use all of our senses at the same time and we kind of come fully alive. That's why it's so important to emphasize when we take children into nature the experience, not just the information. Hearing, what's another sense? Oh, smell, touch, touch. Taste. And you guys know that this plant right here, this is lemonade berry. You can eat those? Yeah, the kumiai. Who's the kumiai? Someone tell me that. The, the, yeah. native, the native people of San Diego, they, they would take the berries and boil it in water and make a nice, sweet little lemony, fresh drink. Should we water it now? Yeah, everybody's eating and make the little. If we engage our youth in understanding what these habitats are, how they can enjoy them, why they're so important, and how they can protect them for the future, then hopefully we can engender a lifetime stewardship ethic and build a substantive connection with the environment so that these youth can go on in the future to really create a legacy. Um, for future generations to have these beautiful places um, that we are so lucky to have in San Diego County. The idea of creating a legacy that cherishes San Diego's natural treasures is not new. When urban planner and landscape architect John Nolan surveyed this region in the early 1900s, he was struck by what he saw. In his 1908 plan for the city, he wrote, the scenery is varied and exquisitely beautiful. The great, broad, quiet mesas, the picturesque canyons, the bold line of distant mountains, the wide, hard ocean beaches, the Great Bay. These are but some of the features of the landscape that should be looked upon as precious assets to be preserved and enhanced. But Nolan went on to scold San Diego, calling the city neither interesting nor beautiful, in part because it had done little or nothing to secure the benefits of its great natural resources. Urban planners Kevin Lynch and Donald Appleyard picked up on this theme in Temporary Paradise, their seminal planning document for the city in 1974. They called the valleys and canyons San Diego's priceless asset, but they were concerned by the number of highways, shopping centers, and parking lots that were cropping up in them. They went on to write, it is of great importance that San Diego now, at the last moment, preserve all the remaining undeveloped valleys and canyons so that the rural character is preserved, even within the city. Well, we've since enacted zoning codes that protect some canyons, but there are civic activists who see the need for a bigger, more comprehensive effort. What they want is to create a countywide open space preserve that would be known collectively as San Diego Regional Canyonlands Park. This group was inspired, in part, by columnist Richard Louvre. Actually, a few years ago, I um, posed this idea in my column in the San Diego Union Tribune, uh, that if you look at the condition now of the canyons, they're being chipped away. As long as they are seen separately, they will continue to deteriorate. If we begin to see all of these canyons as one thing, and name it as such, then if you hurt one canyon, you've hurt them all. Louvre's concept made a lot of sense to landscape architect Vicky Estrada, who grew up exploring San Diego's canyons. My God, every day those canyons were my backyard, you know, and I, uh, I knew every nook and cranny of that canyon, took my dogs out there. I mean, that's where I really got to experience, and frankly, 
I honestly believe that if I would not have experienced those canyons, I would not really would have understood the relationship between nature and people and, and animals and how all that happens. And I think I'm a landscape architect really because of that. So, not everybody is fortunate enough to live next to a canyon. So you start to ask the question, how can we bring that experience of the canyons to everybody? that the one way we can do that is to make it a parkland. It preserves, we're able to maintain it, we're able to provide access where appropriate, and we're able to enhance things and places where we need to. So Estrada and her colleagues at the Citizens Group, San Diego Civic Solutions, developed Louvre's concept into a planning document for Canyonlands Park. It outlines a framework for canyon-friendly urban planning, including rethinking how and where to build next to canyons. What if this dark green was water? I can assure you that no builder, you know, that that, that, that that would have been treated differently. You know, how do we treat the beach? We have a public boardwalk. We have the beach publicly accessible. We have view windows. We have corridors. And yeah, there's houses on the other side of that. If you go along Sunset Cliffs and Point Loma, right, that entire ocean side, there are no houses between the street and Sunset Cliffs. If we would have treated the canyons the same way we did that, they would have been so, so different. And if this would have been water, this would not have been houses. We would have had town centers, we would have had community centers and little nodes overlooking the water, the canyon. We need to start thinking of those canyons given the same value as we would if they were water. That is not a new idea. There are places where um, that has been allowed to happen. This image is looking toward the southeast. We're over the San Diego River, kind of where the fairgrounds are. This is uh, what was called North City West, and here's the San Diego River Valley and San Diego River Park. But look, here's a, the key thing. See how that public road comes in, and guess what? Rather than have houses all along the edge, what they did is kept this open, and they, in fact, have little overlooks and little parks. So it has been done before. But it's not something builders and developers like to do because it's not efficient. Anytime you have a street with houses only on one side, it means it's not as efficient for them. You don't get as many houses. So most builders don't like to do that. But you can see what incredible vistas and opportunities that provides. And it begins to make that place really special. So that's one of the things I believe we can begin to make happen in terms of actually integrating the canyons into the neighborhoods and making them really, really feel like a park. Because what's the point of having a Canyonlands Park if you can't really get to it? You know, I'd like to see a sign at the, if, if a canyon has an entrance, or even if it doesn't, have a sign that says, uh, you are here, and showing the whole canyon system throughout the region, and you are here. And maybe showing a little route to the next canyon, even if you have to walk through the city to get there. So conceivably, you could walk uh, possibly hundreds of miles through this region from canyon to canyon, uh, sometimes through them, sometimes alongside them. When we redevelop, as we're going to do with concepts like city of villages and, and, um, and as the city grows, um, we should take those opportunities to create lookout points at the, at the end of a cul-de-sac so that people can look out over the canyon and, and see the birds and the hawks uh, soaring and hunting and so that people ha can have a, a stronger awareness of their natural history and make that an amenity. One such opportunity presented itself in Mission Hills when an apartment complex was being converted into condominiums. The vacant lot next to the complex had been used for excess parking. But resident John Lomack and his neighbors had something else in mind for this space, a park. This was just an opportunity to take a lot that was just sitting, and we somehow felt that, well, in some ways, if we could get the approval of the property owners, we're going to get the land for free. And that means that you can, in this type of a community, that will save you 800000 to a $1 million. I mean, a half acre in Mission Hills is going to cost that if you were to buy a house and tear it down or two houses to build a park. So if we can get the land at a cheap price, and then it's just literally trying to somehow figure out what can we put on it and then how can we maintain it. The reason the land was free is that the lot is actually the intersection of two unimproved streets. And as Lomac explains, that means the land belonged to the homeowners. 
there's a legal process that's involved, but if you have the, a willingness on the part of the property owners who own to the middle of the street, which is a critically important thing, most people don't realize that they think that the streets are owned by the jurisdictions. Well, they, the jurisdictions have an easement on those streets, but property owners actually, in most jurisdictions, at least in California, own to the middle of each street. So if you want to somehow make that street go away, whether it's improved or unimproved, you have to have the approval of the property owners. So that's a whole process that's important. San Diego is blessed by the fact that these canyon tributaries run all through. So to us, this is a, to the people that started this, it's a great template for other communities, uh, planning groups, to try to do the same kind of creative thing. Be creative because the city does not have the financial wherewithal to go out and buy houses, tear them down, and build parks. So let's find these places where there's dead end streets and intersections and let's build parks. This is one of those interesting ideas that, that I believe if you name it, they will come. Uh, the point is first to name it, to say it's so and then worry about the details. Um, this is one of the cheapest things we could possibly do. The idea of taking advantage of a resource that already exists, that already has an infrastructure of Friends of the Canyons groups, naturalists, birders, others who care about these places, who can form a major volunteer group, can look for foundation money from outside San Diego also, that in itself will take care of a lot of the expense. In the long run, we could point to this as the largest urban park system possibly in the United States, and it already exists. We just have to name it so. Canyonlands Park, as envisioned, would include all of the canyons in San Diego County. But to Sheriff Fistler and the rest of the crew at Aquatic Adventures, why stop at the county lines? They organized a binational wetlands restoration event at the Tijuana River Estuary, where hundreds of volunteers on both sides of the U.S.-Mexico border spent their Saturday as wetland adventures, or Campeones de los Cañones. Give the family of four their t-shirts. When you're done here, you're going to do your name tags, and then from there, we're going to ask you to get right up and get your makeup. 95% of the wetlands in Southern California have been destroyed. Only 10% have been destroyed in Northern Baja. So that's why we're here today. And you can see that on both sides of the border, we are working together to restore habitat, which uh, helps us to understand that we are all part of a single bioregion. So we wear our camouflage today to help us to blend into these environments. We want to make as least of a disturbance as possible when we go into wetlands. We came to this canyon, Yogurt Canyon, it's called on the U.S. side, in Canyon de los Sauces in Mexico, because we needed to choose a site that could handle having a lot of volunteers at it without causing too much harm. So this canyon and mesa area has had a lot of disturbance in the past, um, and it doesn't have really any native plants on it now. So we were trying to do a big project in one clean sweep and get a bunch of native plants in the area. So we need to have a code word, okay? So anytime you see Avengers on the other side, you need to say our code word. What our code word is going to be is wetlands, okay? So anytime you see somebody on the other side, you want to say wetlands, and then they'll respond humedales. Y en inglés es wetlands. Y nosotros vamos a decir humedales. Y vamos a ver, okay? Muy recio para que se nos puede oír, okay? Uno, vamos a hacer humedales. Uno, dos, tres. Humedales! This is a non-native plant called status, and status might look pretty with its uh, purple flower, and that's why people plant it around their houses, but this kind of a plant outcompetes native plants so that they don't have a place to grow, and then the animals that use those native plants to survive don't have a place to survive, okay? So that's why it's really important to know what a non-native plant is and to remove them if they're there. Y esta es una planta que no es nativa. ¿Qué significa no nativa? ¿Qué es eso? No es de aquí, es de otro lugar. Es de otro lugar. Man, these are some stubborn. These are some stubborn. Yeah.
I think it's a really good awareness project for people to understand the importance of our wetlands and to have um, the borders combined together to really work to make sure that as we help these wetlands that more and more people will start to understand how important they are to our ecosystem and how we need them to filter our water and keep them polluted and how they serve to a home for endangered animals. And since I'm like an animal activist and environmentalist, this is just where I'd rather be. Congratulations on having such a great event today. Over 1,400 people, two great nations, but one great biosphere that we're all working to clean up. I want to thank you all for being here this afternoon and participate in this project that is really, really, really very important. They say we're working for an ecological region, and I just say a region, because definitely we're all human beings, we all like basically the same, and today we're joining efforts to have a better region, to have a better place to live. As you've seen tonight, there's something for everybody to do. Whether it's protecting your own piece of canyon, or working with two countries that share a watershed, you can do your part to preserve these natural treasures and make Canyonlands Park your gift to future generations. As planner John Nolan said 100 years ago, no city regrets its acquisition of parks, but many cities regret their failure to act in time. It's not too late for San Diego. I'm Jennifer Whitelaw. Good night. Ground.